1 John on Sunday nights. We left off last week in chapter 3, verse 10, so we're going to pick up in chapter 3, verse 11. 1 John chapter 3, verse 11, we'll go through verse 24. If you would bow with me, let's pray. Lord, we are just excited to come into your house again tonight, Father, Lord, and we just pray that we, as your people, Lord, would just focus on you, Lord. We pray that you will speak to us, that you will open up uh, your word to us, that we will understand it, that we will grab a hold of it, and we'll be transformed by it. May we understand, Lord, not just Father, how you expect us to be, but what you've enabled us to be, what you've empowered us to be through your transformation and through the presence of the Holy Spirit. All this we pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Most of you recognize the uh, 1900s comedian, actor, W.C. Fields. Uh, he was a lot of famous during a, a lot of the black and white era. Uh, it's a really neat story about him that comes when one of his friends went to go see him at his house, and they found, he found W.C. Fields actually reading his Bible. Now, why that was so surprising was because the character that Fields was known for, uh, the, the drunken, womanizing, cantankerous guy, was really his personality. I mean, he was just being himself most of the time. And so his friend said to come and see him actually reading the Bible was something he never would have expected. And so when he came, he said, Fields, what are you doing? Are you trying to find some answers to life? Are you, are you trying to find a solution to a problem? And Fields just looked at him and said, no, I'm not looking for answers. I'm looking for loopholes. That's what I love about that story is the fact I think it was a very candid answer. I'm looking for loopholes. And I got to be honest, I feel a lot of times as believers, as followers of Christ, a lot of times we come to Scripture looking for loopholes. Now, I do believe that Scripture is practically clear most of the time. We know what it says. We just don't like what it says. And so we like to try to find ways to be able to say that it doesn't apply to us. It may apply to somebody else, but it surely doesn't apply to us because we just don't like what it's saying. And I will say one of those things in Scripture that we don't like to talk about, but the one that is keep throwing out is something that Jesus brings up in a lot of passages, especially in a passage like John chapter 15, verse 12, when he says, I expect my followers to love one another in the way that I love them. Now, Jesus says, I expect my followers, believers, to love each other like I love them, like I love you. And we hear that and we go, oh no. I mean, that's like, are we really thinking that we can do this? Can we really love like Christ's love? And so a lot of times we start looking for loopholes. If we can really, if Christ just left it alone, we could water it down. We could talk about intensity. We could say it's a metaphor. But the next verse right after that, Jesus says, no man has no greater love than this, that he gives his life for his friend. And so what Jesus is clearly saying is to love others the way that I love you means you love sacrificially that you love the way that I loved you on the cross. And then we start hearing that. We start going, well, there has got to be a loophole in there. There is no way that we can love each other like that. Half the time, we don't even like each other. Being able to love each other in Jesus Christ is just going to be impossible. There's just no way that we're going to be able to do this. And then we see other times when Jesus says, like in John 13, 35, when he says, this is how everyone's going to know that you're my followers is that you love each other. See, what Jesus says is what's gonna set you apart is not that you wear Christian T-shirts or that you put a fish sticker on the back of your car or if you go around and say, have a blessed day. That's not gonna set you apart from everybody else. What's gonna set you apart is that as believers in Jesus Christ, you actually love one another sacrificially like I love you. And the problem is there's no loopholes. There's no get out of free of loving each other card. There's no exceptions. It's an expectation of all followers of Christ. So if we understand that it's not a loophole, the next question has to be, why? <laughs> why is this put on us? And then number two, how? How are we supposed to do it? And that is what John addresses in our passage tonight. 
First John chapter three, verses 11 through 24, John says that as followers, as believers in Jesus Christ, we are to love each other sacrificially the way that Christ loves us. So now I wanna divide the passage up into three parts. Uh, we we're gonna look at the why, the how, and the what. The why we do it, the how we're able to do it, what it looks like, and, and the what. What it proves when we do it. And if we are looking at this from the eyes of believers, we're looking at this passage through the eyes as, as, as Christians, well, we begin to understand that loving one another is not a suggestion, but an expectation of our king. It is an expectation. And he expects us to do it for very clear and practical reasons. And tonight, if, if someone is not a believer, if you're not a Christian and you're looking at this passage, I'm gonna encourage you to listen in and hear that that through Jesus Christ, people are transformed. We're transformed in such a way that we can actually love one another. And what he has done for us, what Christ has done for us in changing us and making us being able to do that, he'll also do for you if you come to him through faith in Jesus Christ. That's what he wants to do for all people. So as we begin tonight, let me give you the context of the background from our passage so we can kind of see how John's uh, conversation is flowing. If you remember that 1 John is a letter, and it's written by the Apostle John, one of the original 12 disciples selected by Jesus. And John is later in his life, and he's writing to a group of, of believers, a group of churches, possibly around the city of Ephesus. And he's writing to them because they've had a difficult time. This is a church that he knows. These are people he's got a background with. And for some reason, within this group, uh, there is a, a smaller group that, that believes that they have received some special teaching, some special instruction, some stuff that no one else knows, a spirit-inspired teaching that opened them up to stuff that no one else previously understood. And part of that information was that Jesus was not God and Jesus is not the only way to have eternal life. And they began sharing that special instruction, and it didn't go so well in the group. They had fighting over it, and they had disagreements. So this, this group that had the special instruction, the special teaching from wherever it came from, they left. And the group of true believers that remained, they were rattled. And they were frustrated and they were hurting. And John writes this letter. He writes it to encourage them to hold on to the truth of Jesus Christ, to hold on to what they know is true. But another big purpose of this letter was that John was trying to help the, these believers understand the difference between those who had a relationship with God through faith in Jesus Christ and those who did not. And in chapter 5, verse 1, all the way to chapter 3, verse 10, which is the first major section of the letter, John is spelling out, listen, if you've got a relationship with God through faith in Christ, it's going to come out in the way that you live. You can't know Jesus and not be changed. You can't be indwelled by the Holy Spirit and not be empowered. You're going to be different. And he talks about how we view sin and how we view obedience and how we're able to hold on to the truths of Jesus Christ. And the point that, that John is putting across is that those folks who got up and left who were denying Christ, they don't have a relationship with God and they do not have eternal life. But you that remained, you that still testify that Jesus Christ is God, who have the only way to, to be, have a relationship with God, you have eternal life. He's showing the distinction and encouraging them. And then as we start getting to chapter 3, verse 11, we're getting to the second major part of the letter. This section goes all the way to chapter 5, verse 12. And in this section, second part of the letter, what John does, he says, not only does your lifestyle show that you have a relationship with God through faith in Christ, he says, not only the, 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 the way that you, the, that you view sin and, and the way that you view obedience and, and the way that, that, that you view the family of Christ and, and the way that, that, that you grab a hold of the truths of Jesus, not only does that reveal your relationship with him, but there's also another way that reveals that you have a relationship with God through faith in Christ. And he says, it's by the way you love your brothers and sisters in Jesus. 
that also shows that relationship. And so as he begins in verses 11 through 15, he's going to tell us the why. The why we are to do it. Why we are to love our brothers and sisters in Christ. Look again at what it says in verses 11 through 15. For this is the message that you heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. Not as Cain, who was of the wicked one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his works were evil. And his brother's righteous. Do not marvel, my brethren, if the world hates you. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love the brethren. He who does not love his brother abides in death. Whoever hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. So John comes out and he says very clearly in verse 11, he says, listen, remember what you were taught from the beginning. Remember what you were commanded from the very beginning. Know that when we started hanging out with you, we told you very clearly some basic stuff. And what he's referring to is some of the things that we just talked about in the gospel of John. John chapter 13, John chapter 15, that Jesus commanded us to love one another, to love the way that Christ loves us, to love sacrificially, that, that we are loving one another, sets us apart from everyone else. John says, keep in mind that this was commanded to you from the very beginning. And so that really is the first why. Why are we supposed to do it? Why are we supposed to love one another as followers of Christ? Because Jesus told us to. That's the first why. Because not only is Christ to be our Savior, He's also supposed to be your Lord. And if He is your Lord, you do what He says. And this is what brings up a really interesting thing, something I think that we usually pass over real quick as believers, that our walk with Christ, that our daily walk with him, that our Christian living is actually interconnected with the community of Jesus Christ. It's connected in the community. That while we have a personal relationship with God through faith in Jesus Christ, that relationship is meant to be lived out in community. That while you have an individual decision to have a relationship with him, it's not to be lived out as an individual. We are called to live it out in community. And while you have a personal faith, your faith is never meant to be private because our God and King commanded that we love one another and work in community. And as I begin to tell you that, you should be scared. And you go, why should I be scared? Because your community, as get presented in the New Testament, is the local church. And that means that your daily personal walk with Jesus Christ is interconnected with these people who are sitting around you right now. Have you looked at the people who are sitting around you right now? Take a moment. See what I see. Look around. Look at those in the... <laughs> There it is. Look in the front. Look in the back. And you start looking and then start thinking about the people who are here this morning. And then somewhere in the back of your mind, you should be thinking, oh, no. Is my really, my personal uh, walk with Christ interconnected with the community of Christ found in the local church? And the answer is yes. So as that comes across, the next question clearly has to be why? Why? Why are we commanded to do this? I mean, why are we told to do this? Because Christ has commanded it, that we are to interact, love one another in community. Why? Outside of the command, why? In verses 12 through 15, he makes it clear. The reason why we are to do it is because we can. That's the answer. We can. See, John lays it out very quickly. He says, you are not like Cain. You are not like the guy in Genesis chapter 4, verses 1 through 16, who killed his brother. 
Cain, as it's called by John, is controlled just like the world. is controlled by the evil one. And because he was controlled by the evil one, like the world is controlled by the evil one, he had hate in his heart, and he murdered his brother. And we sit here and say, praise God, I have not murdered a brother or sister in Christ yet. I've wanted to murder a brother and sister in Christ, but I've never acted on it, right? I'm not a murderer. That's kind of the, that's kind of the route we go to. I've never killed anybody. Yeah, see, so here's the problem. See, I think John knew this was coming because in verse 15, he lays it out for us. He makes it very clear. He lays out principles that we're told in Exodus chapter 20, verse 13, and Deuteronomy chapter 19, verse 11. And what Jesus explains very clearly in Matthew chapter 5, verses 21 through 22, that what comes out of the heart matters. That what comes out of the heart is more important than the external. See, Jesus made it very clear that hatred comes out of the heart and it may manifest itself in physically killing someone. But Jesus said, if hatred comes out of the heart and it manifests itself by verbally killing someone, it's just as bad to a holy and righteous God. That if out of the heart comes thoughts that are, that are not nice, that are, that are not unifying, that are not loving, it's just as bad to a holy God as actually physically killing someone. Now, keep in mind, the state of North Carolina does not have that viewpoint. Just want to lay that out there. But to a holy and righteous God, it's all the same. And what John is laying out is this. He is saying that we are not like that. We have been changed. We have been transformed. We have been brought from death to light to darkness to light. We have come from hatred to love. We are having and have the ability to forgive, to love, to encourage because we have been changed by Jesus Christ and empowered by the Holy Spirit. We are different. So why do we do it? We're commanded. Why do we do it? Because we can we're changed. We're not like the world. Now, you may be thinking, well, Brad, does that mean that, that, that we're never going to have issues or disagreements or, 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 or they're not going to have some friction? Of course we're going to have those, right? You got to keep everything in context. Listen, every family that I know that loves each other, they get on each other's nerves, don't they? I, I believe, I don't know about you, every Thanksgiving is a free-for-all in my household. You know, if you spend enough time together, there's going to be friction. There's going to be selfishness. There, there's going to be self-centeredness. That, that's who we are. And remember, 1 John chapter 1, verses 8 through 10. If you say you're not a sinner, you are a liar. If you say you're not a sinner, you're saying God is a liar. Listen, we're not perfect. But there is a distinction that John makes in here. It's not easy to see in the, in the English translations, and I'll be honest with you. In the New Testament, the language, in the Greek, it, it makes clear sense. Because the verbs in verses 14 and 15 are in the present tense. And what that means is this, that it's present and ongoing. So what he's saying is this. If you are right now and continually unable to forgive, if you are right now continually and unable to live in peace, uh, you are right now and continually unable to have love, he says, then you're not a believer. And you go, why not? Well, Christian, we have God the Spirit in us, do we not? Do we not have the Holy Spirit? Has anyone ever been chastised by the Holy Spirit? Anyone ever been beaten around the head and neck by the God who loves us saying, we're not gonna do it that way? If you've got God the Spirit, you can't keep running after it. Remember, as John has said over and over again, what does light have to do with darkness? What does God have to do with sin? And the answer is nothing. So what John is laying out, he's saying, listen, you can't continually pursue this stuff and be a believer. Not because of who we are. Because Lord knows we could do it for as long as eternity had in front of us. It's because of the God who's within us. So John lays out there, we are to love one another. And why are we to do that? Because Christ commanded it. Why else are we to do it? Because we can. 
We have been transformed. We have been changed. We have been empowered by the Holy Spirit. We can love each other. Therefore, we are because our king commanded. That's the why. So if you understand the why, in verses 16 through 18, John gives us the how. And by the how, we mean how it practically looks, what it looks like when we do it. Look again what it says in verses 16 through 18. He says, by this, we know love because he laid down his life for us. And we also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whoever has the world's goods and and sees his brother in need and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? My little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and truth. John comes out real quick and he tells us the how or, or, or how we're supposed to do it. He says, once again in verse 16, that this is how we know what love is. This is what love looks like. It's because he, and that's Jesus, laid down his life for us. And so therefore we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. So we are told right out of the gate that the example of love that we are to follow is Jesus. And it's Jesus' death on the cross. It's that Jesus who loved us and did not need to die, died for us knowing that we needed him to die for us. That he didn't do it for himself, he did it for us. He did it sacrificially giving up himself for us out of love. That's the example of love. So as he laid down his life for us, we are to lay down our lives for others. And so the question is, how are we to lay down our lives for others? What does, what does that look like? Now, honestly, I I will tell you, I do believe that how it specifically looks in my life, in your life, in your life, in your life is gonna be different. Because we have different contexts, we have different environments, we know different people, we're at different stages of life. And so how we're gonna know to practically lay down our life and love for others is gonna be as the king tells us to do it. But there are some ways that are going to be general. Like number one, we know that in order to lay down our lives for the others around us, for our brothers and sisters in Christ, it means that we're gonna have to give up some comfort and we're gonna have to give up some time and we're gonna have to give up some some resources and and we're gonna have to give up our abilities. We're gonna have to give something up. We're gonna have to put them before ourselves as Christ did for us. So is there another way that we can even get more in the example of what this is going to look like? And I'll say yes, because John's given us a great example. He's going to say it's practical. It's tangible. And and that's what he brings it down. He says, who of us can, can look at and see someone in need and that needs the goods of the world and just kind of say, hey, we're all good and not help them? He's saying, what kind of love is that? What John says is that love is practical. It is an action. It's tangible. It's visible. Just as Jesus Jesus Christ's death on the cross was was practical and tangible and visible, it is our love for others will be as well. And and he's picking up once again from other parts of, of the Bible. Deuteronomy 15, 7 through 9. James chapter two, verses 15 through 16. This this is what James chapter two, verses 15 through 16 says. If a brother or sister, once again, we know these are believers, other believers. If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, depart in peace, be warmed and filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? If you know they need help and you got the stuff to give them help and you don't give it to them, what does that say? What James is saying is that this type of sacrificial love is visible, it's practical, it's tangible, it's sacrificial. There's an old story about this guy. He's been married several years to his wife. He comes home every day. And he comes home and he's just completely just just nasty from his work. And he comes through the back door 
doesn't say anything to his wife. He just kicks off his shoes and just leaves them kind of close to the middle of the floor, walks by, doesn't speak to her, gets something like something to drink, a tea or a Coke from the fridge and sits down on his recliner and waits for his wife to bring him his supper every night without even talking or engaging with her. And his wife faithfully has done this for years, sacrificially loving her husband. Well, one day this guy is going to work and he's listening to a Christian radio program. And they start talking about sacrificially loving those around them. And the Holy Spirit smacks him upside the head and says, this is what your wife has been doing for you for years. And, and conviction falls in, in that car uh, like a ton of bricks. And he goes, you know what? My wife has been showing me sacrificial love for years and I, I need to show it to her as well. Ask God to forgive him as he's praying. He's going through work and, and he's trying to work out what he can do. At the end of the day, he's got an idea. And so he stays at work and they have showers and he showers and he shaves. And he had an extra set of clothes there just for emergency. So he puts on clean clothes. And on the way home, he goes by the florist and gets her flavored flowers that, that, that she always loves. And he never gives her anymore. And instead of going to the back door, he goes to the front door and he rings the doorbell and his wife answers the door and he says, honey, I want you to know that I love you and I want to take you out to dinner tonight. And his wife just looks at him. Jaw flies open. She begins to cry. I mean, it's streaming down her eyes. And she looks at her husband. She says, I don't know how much more of this I can take. It's been the worst day of my life. Your son was skateboarding and he fell and broke his leg. I have been in the hospital almost all day trying to help him. I get home no more than two minutes and, and your mother calls and she's coming for a two-week visit. No one should have to endure your mother for that long. And then I am trying to wash clothes in the basement and, 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 the, and the whole uh, washing machine just explodes. We got two feet of water down there. I can't get anybody to come fix it. And now you come home drunk. When did you start drinking in the middle of the day? The purpose of the story is to say that, that the love of Christ is shocking to a world. That when we love others sacrificially, it is different. It is shocking. And it's supposed to be different. It's supposed to be shocking because our example is Jesus Christ. That a holy God let this holy throne, because of his holy love, to come and die on a cross on our behalf as our substitute to satisfy his holy righteousness so that through faith in him, we can forever be in a relationship with him knowing his holy love. That is the amazing love of Christ that is our example. And this is what John is saying you want to know what love looks like? You want to know the sacrificial love that we're supposed to show? It's the love of Jesus. The love that knows no boundaries. The love that puts others before us. A love that's shocking to the world. A love that we have been transformed and empowered to do. And a love that is really going to be specific in the areas that he's placed us. If you have someone around you, a believer, a brother and sister in Christ that, that needs someone to spend time with them, then you spend time with them. If they need something repaired, you try to get it fixed. If they need food and clothes, you get them food and clothes. Whatever they need in that and you're able to do, you do it through the love of Christ. That's the how. It's practical. It's tangible. It's relevant. Just like his death on the cross. That's the how. We love sacrificially as he loved us in a way that meets the needs of those around us. Just like Jesus. That's the why. That's the how. And in verses 19 through 24, we see the what. What does it prove? Now, kind of right out of the gate, when we think about what does it prove, we're going to say, well, it definitely proves for the world to see that we're different and we have a relationship with God through faith in Christ. And yes, it does prove that. And that's something that will come out because Jesus said that when we love one another, it sets us apart as different from the world. But John goes a different avenue. 
Instead of saying it proves to the world that you have a relationship with God through faith in Christ, what he comes out as saying is it gives you assurance as a believer. It's your assurance that you have a relationship with God through faith in Christ. Look what he says in verse 19. He says, and by this we know that we are of the truth. We know that we know the truth, that we have a relationship with the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. John continues and he talks about our hearts and, and how we will know and be able to do. He talks about following Christ's commands and then verse 24, he winds up saying, now he who keeps his commandments abides in him and he in him. And by this we know that we abide in us by the spirit whom he has given us. So what is John saying? John says, listen, when you're able to do this, it gives believers assurance that they're actually saved. Now, it seems like a strange thing to say, right? But keep in mind a couple things, that in 1 John, just like in the Gospel of John, John will say, I'm writing these things to you so that you know that you're saved. It's amazing to me, I often talk to believers who are not sure that they're saved. When the Scriptures tell us, you can know. You can have that assurance. You don't have to wonder. But in John in this, also keep in mind, he's writing to a group of Christians who have been struggling with a group that left. That group that left are continually telling them that you believe the wrong things. And John said, let me tell you. Let me tell you how you know that you got a relationship with God. He says, if you have the desire that you want to love your brother and sister in Christ, if you have a desire and you want to do it in tangible, practical ways, and you don't want to do it to, to, to lift yourself up, you don't want to do it to make you feel better about you, and you don't want to do it to glorify yourself, but you want to do it because you love Christ and you know Christ loves you, he says, be assured. You got a relationship with God through Jesus. And you're like, well, how does he know that? Because John says, you can't do that unless you have the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit is the only one that's gonna give you that, allow you to do that, motivate you to do that. And you ain't got the Holy Spirit unless you've come to God through faith in Jesus Christ. So John says, it's, a, it's an easy equation. If you love, if you have a desire, we ain't always gonna get it right. But if you got that desire and you wanna do it in practical, tangible, personal ways, Take heart, because you can't do that unless you have the Holy Spirit in you, telling you, encouraging you, moving you, pushing you, allowing you. And you ain't got God the Spirit unless you come to God the Father through God the Son. He said, just take heart. Several years ago in Cincinnati, Ohio, in the municipal court system, there was a guy who came to trial by the name of Eric Hines. Eric Hines was actually accused of, of receiving stolen goods. And he's standing before a guy by the name of John, Judge John Burlow. And Hines' attorney said, uh, asked the judge to basically just release uh, Eric Hines, not, not, to, not to set bail, just release him because he wanted to come back and, and he wanted to defend himself because Eric Hines said, said I, I'm innocent. And his attorney said that Eric Hines was a guy who had a long-standing job in the community. He was a fixture in the community, but more than that, he was a part of his church in the community. And through his church, he was reaching out to those around him. So his attorney told Judge Burlow, just let this guy go. Don't, don't, he's got a lot of money. Don't, don't set bail at anything. Just like, he's going to come back and want to clear his name. And he's not going anywhere because he's too invested in the community through his church. Judge Burlow looked at Eric Hines and he said, I tell you what, I'll make you a deal. I will do that if you can recite to me clearly, plainly, without hesitation, the 23rd Psalm. Eric Hines stepped up, all six verses without hesitation. Judge Burlow kept his end of the bargain, released him without bail. I mean, no, no bail set, believing he would come back. Judge Burlow was just murdered in the papers with everything. He was accused of showing favoritism. 
He was accused of, because this guy said he was a Christian, you just let him out. Burlow actually held a press conference and he said, no, 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 let me make something clear. He goes, I hear that stuff all the time. People stand before me and say that they're a Christian, they're part of their church, and I should release them, and they'll come back, and they never do. He says, I needed tangible, verifiable evidence that what this attorney was saying about his client was true. And by him being able to give me something, it showed me that the character that this supposed guy had was viable. In the story is that Eric Hines did come back like he said he was, and he was acquitted because of lack of evidence. Christian, what we need to understand is this, is that loving other Christians does not make us saved. Loving other Christians does not give us forgiveness of our sin. Loving other Christians does not give us a relationship with God, but it sure does prove that we have it. It is external, verifiable proof that we have a relationship with God through faith in Jesus Christ. Because the bottom line is this, is we can't do it without the Holy Spirit. And you ain't got the Holy Spirit, you don't have a relationship with God through faith in Christ. It's that simple. This doesn't make you saved. It just proves that you are. That's what John says. So as we come and look at the text, and we always like to ask this question is, how should we respond to what we're being told? How should we respond to what John is saying? And to me, one of the major and easiest ways to respond to this passage tonight is for believers to love Christians sacrificially. It is to love other believers in Jesus Christ sacrificially as Christ loves us. That's the response, because that's what John's talking about. So what does that mean to us? Well, tonight, if you're not a Christian, if you're not a believer, you gotta understand that you can't truly love others sacrificially until you've experienced the sacrificial love of God through Jesus Christ. That's where it begins. You can't do it without him. And honestly, that is what God is inviting you to do. He's inviting you to actually stop running away from him and come to him believing that Jesus, because of his love for you, died on the cross. And because he alone paid for the penalty of your sin, because he alone took God's wrath, because he alone paid a debt that you can't pay, that he alone can forgive, rescue, and reconcile you to God forever. That's what God's inviting you to do tonight is to come to him through faith in Christ and experience that amazing love. And then he will transform you. He will change you. He will make you new. And then you will be able to love those around you through the power of the Holy Spirit. Just a few moments, we'll have the invitation. And it is a time that you're just able to respond to what the Holy Spirit is telling you. And I do believe that the Holy Spirit makes us completely aware of who we are and how we stand before God. And I do believe that he will tell you whether or not you have a relationship with God through faith in Christ, because that's what he does. And tonight, if the Holy Spirit is telling you that, what you need to say is, I accept God's offer. I'm gonna stop running away from him and I'm gonna come to him through Jesus, because I believe he is the only way. We'll be standing, we'll be singing. Pastor Michael and I will be down here. We'd love to talk to you about what your life would be like with Christ was in it. Love to tell you what he's done for us and how you can have a relationship with him. Christian, as we look at this, let me remind you what Jesus told us, how we show that we belong to him. Not by T-shirts. It's not by car magnets. It's not by telling people to have a blessed day. Those aren't bad, but those do not reveal who we are. The way that Jesus says that we show that is by loving one another. It's by loving him. By loving him and loving others, brothers, sisters in Christ in practical, tangible ways, sacrificial ways as Christ loved us. We need to understand that this really isn't a suggestion It's an expectation. And why is it an expectation? 
because we have been transformed, we have been changed, and we have been empowered. He's not asking us to do anything that he's not equipped us to do. And then the final things he's commanded us. And if he's our Lord, the answer is always yes. It's an expectation that we love one another. So Christian, as we come into the time of the invitation, I'm just gonna encourage you to pray. Just encourage you to pray. And say, Lord, what is it that you want me to do to show love to my brothers and sisters in Christ that you've placed around me? I do believe at this point it's personal. I really do. What he's calling me to do, what he's calling you to do, what he's calling you to do, it's gonna be different because he's got different people around us. We've got different opportunities. So the question's gonna be, God, in my context, in my time, what is it that you want me to do for your will and your glory? Is it to have a cup of coffee with somebody? Is it to help them fix something? Is it just to spend time with them? Is it to watch their kids? Is it to take them a meal? What can I do, Lord? What is it that you want me to do? Because the bottom line, Christian, if he is your king, then the answer is just yes. Ask the Holy Spirit what it is I'm supposed to do to show your love to my fellow believers as you've asked me to do. And then whatever he says to do, guess what the response needs to be? Just yes. That's it. So as you're praying through that, if you need help and encouragement, you just can pray at the altar. You can come down, pray with Pastor Michael and I, or you can pray with those beside you. Whatever he leads you to do, ask. And the answer is just yes. No matter who you are tonight, seek your king. Be open to the Holy Spirit. And just follow him. Father, we praise you, we glorify you, we exalt you. We thank you, Lord, for understanding that in you we are different, we are changed. We're able to do things that the world can't do. And one of those is actually love one another sacrificially. And Lord, we know that we've been transformed. We know we've been empowered. And Lord, we know it sets us apart. And we do not do it for our own glory. We do it for yours. Lord, I pray that you just lead us And just the simple life of following you moment by moment, day by day, breath by breath. And as we walk beside you, we will naturally just show your love in any way, shape, or form. Lord, help us just to be faithful and focused. And allow us just to hear you and obey you. And Lord, our ultimate prayer is that when people see us, is that they see you. And they'll come to know the name of Christ. And they'll have everything that you've offered and everything you want to give. May they see you in us. We pray this in your holy and righteous name. Amen. Time we call the invitation.